Hello everybody. Today I'm sitting down with Pam Baker. She is the author of this book, Something from Eddie. It's a story about how our veterans are being treated today. Um, and we get to learn about Eddie and who is Eddie Livingston. He got into the Army when he was 15 years old at a young age, uh, fought for this country, and then he had to fight for his benefits. Uh, so we get to sit down with his niece, Pam Baker. She's going to tell us about the stories and some of the things he's done throughout his life. Next on the Small Business Voice. Hello everybody and thank you for watching a very special Small Business Voice. Small Business Voice is a platform for small business owners to have their voice heard. And today we're actually taking a different approach and we're sitting down with author Pam Baker who wrote about her uncle, Eddie Livingston. Thanks for joining us today, Pam. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I was reading this book and there's a lot of things that jump out. Um, but tell me about Eddie as a, as a boy before he went into the military. Yeah, so Eddie um, served in World War II, and he, his family were sharecroppers, so they, um, you know, kids were required to work, like a lot of people were, and uh, they, then he went to CCC camps in Oregon, and um, yeah, he joined the Army at 15. So, 15 years yes. old. So, you told me a story about how Eddie was with animals. He, he loved animals to the day he died, basically. Um, tell me the story about him hiding the dog. Well, uh, because they were so uh, poor, you know, they didn't have a lot of food to eat. So they, uh, if they had a dog that hunted, if it hunted, they could keep it. But if it didn't hunt, they would shoot it. His paw would shoot it. So he would hide his dog so that uh, he could keep his dog. So he loved the animals his whole life. So it just kind of shows us, you know, how caring this Eddie Livingston is. Um, now, he went to church as a child. Um, and this is back in the, what, late 30s, early 40s, when he went to, yes. he was eight years old. Right. Um, but he, a lot of people say he was ahead of his time. Um, what, what stood out in, in church to him that kind of made him different from, the, so, let me back up for a second. Eddie Livingston grew up in Alabama, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so, we're in California, our, you know, our state's a lot different from Alabama, as we all know, especially in the 30s. Uh, 30s, it was very segregated. Right, right. So, uh, I, like I said, he was, he was ahead of his time. So, how, how was he ahead of his time? Can you tell me a story about something that happened in church where he just, like, the, the alarm went off in his head? Well, when Eddie was eight years old, his uh, parents went to church, his whole family, and he was in church, and the pastor of the church was praising those men for doing God's work. And what he was referring to is they had lynched a black human being. And it, it moved Eddie at eight years old. He said, I knew when I grew up, I had to do something about it. So that never, ever left Eddie. He was very heavily involved in the civil rights movement. And, but it, that's where it started. It wasn't through war, although that, that was part of it, but that's what started it. So he always had that sense of right and wrong, even at eight years old. Yeah, and, and we don't talk about that, you know, when we hear about those times, you know, we hear about the bad times. And there's a lot of people back then that felt the same way as Eddie, correct? There, there's a lot of people, but they don't get hurt. It gets shouted out over the negative parts of things, but there's people that, you know, actually do care, that do have a sense of right and wrong. And, you know, Eddie felt like we shouldn't have to have laws that, you know, to take the white only signs down. Why can't we do that out of decency? You know, so he felt very strongly about that. And, and I know it wasn't popular in the South to be doing that, but you know, that was a sense of right and wrong. And he felt that all human beings, you know, we're all United States citizens that, and all Americans, that we shouldn't have to have laws that separate us and not allowed to go to this bathroom or this restaurant because of the color of your skin. And he lived that all his days. So, so let's fast forward a little bit. So Eddie was 15 years old when he went into the Army. Yes. Um, was there a reason why you joined the Army so young? Well, uh, again, it's like a lot of the, those country kids are sharecroppers or you know, they're poor. So it was a way to 
to uh, make a living and uh, be able to eat. And so he would send, so he joined at uh, 15, he was in the Army Air Corps originally, and then he uh, got demoted or something happened that he was a staff sergeant and then he got demoted. And to be in the, he was in the 82nd Airborne and you had to be a volunteer. So that month and back to private, he was able to volunteer and then he was part of the 82nd Airborne. So he was early on where they were testing, he tested equipment for the Army and uh, he had a lot of training to go through to, to be accepted. So you had to, they only took the best. And so he was 82nd Airborne, 82nd Airborne 504, 3rd Battalion, I Company. He always took me that by heart. <laughs> yeah. That was his heart too. So, um, and this is a man that had the third grade uh, only education. Went to the third grade. Only went to the third grade. So, I mean, again, that was a lot of, you know, they, they worked in the fields, they had to, the, to eat. He said, you know, you go to bed hungry, you wake up hungry, you know, and that's how it was for them. And uh, so everybody had to work, but it didn't matter what age you were. So, yeah, so he had a, a work ethic going into the, uh, the Army, and uh, so the 82nd Airborne is uh, kind of what kicked it off for him. And uh, I don't know if you want me to go into that right now, but he was the, they were the first to go overseas. He started in North Africa and he actually served in uh, five European campaigns. So it was Anzio, Salerno, Casino, Sicily, Normandy, and he was also a prisoner of war, uh, captured in Normandy on, on June 9th. So he volunteered to jump with the Pathfinders into Normandy and uh, he got captured trying to save others from getting captured and that's how he got captured. So we'll back up a second, that's fine. So he was 15 when he enlisted, right. went through everything. How old was he when he, when he was overseas? Uh, well, he was still a teenager, so he should have been in high school. So he was still he was, in high school. He should, should have been, have been in, high in high school. Cool. Yes. So he, he was subject to a lot of uh, unspeakable things right. at such a young age. Right. Well, he saw a lot of combat. He saw a lot of death. That's not what you're prepared for. And uh, yeah, so just a lot of things that emotionally nobody's prepared for that. Um, but, but he had that sense of right and wrong. Yeah, he did have a sense of right, right and, and wrong. And so he volunteered yes. to, to fight for our country yes. in yes, more ways did. than one. Yes, absolutely. He absolutely did. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to take a break, and then we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Every journey begins with a single step. Are you ready to take yours? Here at Modesto Junior College, we can help you begin. The college offers a variety of programs and opportunities, including financial aid. MJC students can transfer to four-year colleges after graduating. Our instructors will prepare you for a successful future in the field of your choice. If you want a quality, affordable education with unlimited horizons, make Modesto Junior College your first step. All right, we're back with Pam Baker, author of Something from Eddie. Um, just a touching book. Um, and I want to talk about the POW experience. He was a, he was a POW at such a young age, um, and he witnessed a lot of things. He went through a lot of things. Can, can you go into that for us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Eddie was he jumped uh, volunteered to jump with the Pathfinders in the Normandy. So they were the first to jump that night. And the reason they needed volunteers is because they needed uh, guys with combat experience. So Eddie jumped that night. A lot of them were killed on the jump. And uh, Eddie was, he lasted out there three days, so he uh, he was captured on June 9th, 1944. And and the Germans were tipped off, correct? Yes, yes. And they they kind of knew that because they were being shot at as they, they flew in. So they knew they were in trouble right from the start. And they flew at uh, not, not very high, so they didn't have really a lot of time to jump. And uh, so he was able to get down, but, uh, so he was captured on June the 9th. And he actually got captured trying to save other guys from being captured. So he exposed himself to the enemy. They were able to get away. And that's what he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for, but he actually never got it. And uh, so when they captured him, they, they beat him with it and they bayoneted him. Um, he had a problem with one of his thumbs, but uh, he was trying to catch the bayonet from getting him in the gut. Mm -hmm. So they beat him pretty bad. And um, then they, uh, the, the first stop point that they took him to, they, they lined three guys up and they made Eddie dig their grave plus one more. So that was to intimidate Eddie to think that you know he would be the fourth one. So he had to dig their grave and uh, uh, they shot those guys right in front of Eddie. And so from there they went to uh, 
through Paris. So he wrote a story about the first time I saw Paris. So the, the French were not as welcoming as a lot of people think. And uh, so they were went through town, they were trying to get him to the, the train, you know, to get him out of there. So that was the start of uh, his prisoner of war. And he said he knew when he was captured that his life was over. Um, so, he, so he started uh, there, they went to Paris, they got him on the cattle car. The Allied bombers actually didn't know that their own um, uh, soldiers were in there. So they were being bombed while they were taken to Germany. So after they got to Germany, Eddie was put on a, in a work camp on, in Belsen and Buchenwald, one of the death camps. And so they would put him in groups of 10, and they would tell him if one of them escapes, they're going to shoot the other nine. So they would spread them out throughout the camp, so whatever they had to do that day, um, they, they had also had to worry that nobody tried to escape because then that means the others are going to be shot. So Eddie was put on a work crew where they were torturing uh, Jews uh, in front of him and he had to clean the blood off the floor and the walls. And uh, he didn't say too much about that. He wrote a little bit about it, but uh, so that he witnessed that. And then they shipped him to Czechoslovakia and they had to work in the coal mines and they uh, were starving to death, they didn't feed him very much, and they, uh, they were forced to work naked. And they, uh, if they were slow or didn't keep up, they would beat him. Uh, so apparently, through Eddie's writings, I can see that he was beat as well. So humiliation, starvation, and you know, just to stay alive. So if they didn't work, they were beat or shot, and he witnessed that as well. And he was a POW for a year, at least. Yes, yes, till the end of the war. Till the end of the war. and. His parents didn't even know where he was for that whole. No, year. no. Yeah, there's a letter in here from, from Captain Burris. Yes, well, she wrote to her. They were trying to find it. Even the army didn't know where he was. So uh, in that letter, it, it indicates that they watched him jump. But Eddie said that wasn't true. He said nobody watched anybody jump. He said they would just write letters like that to make the parents feel good. But so they didn't know where Eddie was, and so his mom was trying to uh right to find him so that they absolutely didn't know that he was captured even the army didn't know he was captured so there was no red cross involvement or anything getting to to any of those guys so he jumped with his crew and, and his uh his battalion was the jokers i read that in there that, that was yeah their, that's what they call yeah yeah that's what they call themselves right. and, and you see that that's pretty common yes um he landed um not touched basically, but the rest of his platoon were Well, there was killed. different, yeah. I mean, there was some, that, a lot of them were killed that night because they were shooting at him as they were jumping out of the sky. So he was one of them that was able to make it. But they were trained, the airborne was trained on fight behind enemy lines, and that was initially why they were jumping, is to, to support Omaha Beach. But they were getting slaughtered themselves, so that never happened. Well, he, he landed. Um, there were three of his comrades that were um, landed on barbed wire, um, got captured, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but he, he did play dead, didn't he? Yes, yes, he did. And and that actually allowed him to help save some of his... Right, for him to, to continue on. So for the next three days he was out. He knew, as a, he, he told me this, that he knew being a country boy, knowing how to hunt for food, that he could live out there for at least 30 days, is what he said. But, uh, but no, he, he did try to save his... Uh, he didn't even know who they were that he was saving. Mm -hmm. He just knew that they were in trouble. So he thought, he, you know, I, I think by then he's fatigued, he's tired, and you think you can you know, help, and he wound up getting captured that way. Yeah. Well, and then also, as I was reading through, um, and we're going to get to his post-military career afterwards, but his life was saved by a man that we don't know his name. Um, a black man um, saved Eddie. We don't know the circumstances, but he lost his arm doing it. Well, in the Anzio, they were, if you read about Anzio, which that was a long, long battle, it was, they were in constant fire. So they were in foxholes, and, and you had to expose yourself to be able to return fire. And so apparently the, the, the person he's talking about was in the foxhole next to him and lost his arm to save Eddie's life. So it might have been, you know, how they were coming up out, maybe that guy came up to save Eddie, you know, I don't really know the full extent of that, but um, but that's part of Eddie's, you know, civil rights um, story. Yeah, well, and just like I said, he's, he's ahead of his time, you know, he heard about the lynching when he was eight years old, he, he knew that wasn't right. Right. And in turn, you know, when you give to people, you get something back. Right. And right. he didn't realize what he was doing at the time. Right. But that was probably 
his way of getting something back. And right, right. So it, I, I thought that was actually really kind of just amazing to read something like right. that. You know, especially taken back in the early 40s. Right. Well, you know, they never, you know, those combat vets don't forget each other. They know what the sacrifices are. You know, Eddie would never refer to himself as a hero. Those ones that lost their life are heroes. And you talk to any combat vet, they, they will never refer to themselves like that. So it's always the other guy. And, you know, and that was true to Eddie. He always knew who saved his life, you know, who was there. Never talk about their own sacrifices or their own hardships. That's an incredible thing that I found out about veterans, about how much they keep inside, mm -hmm. but how much they endured. And we're fortunate, you know, with Eddie's story to be able to reveal some of that. All right, well, thank you. We're going to go ahead and take a break real quick. And we'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. When it comes to getting your car detailed, it's hard to choose the right place. At Davis Family Shines, we sweat the small stuff so you don't have to. At DFS, we're fully licensed and insured, guaranteeing your car is in good hands. With over 15 years of professional detailing, you can trust we're experienced and know how to take care of whatever life throws your way. Specializing in automotive restoration, we're offering interior-only details as low as $99 and complete details as low as $199. That's a huge savings. With a variety of packages including headlight restoration and windshield repair, you'll be sure to find a deal to fit your car's needs. Call today to schedule your appointment, 209-495-0525 or go online at modestocardetailing.com. Treat yourself to that new car feeling today. We're back with Pam Baker, author of Something From Eddie. Um, just an excellent book. This is available on Amazon, correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. Um, it's paperback. It, it's an easy read, and, and there's so much information in here. Um, it's just an amazing book. So he gets back home. He, he's a POW for over a year. About a year. About yes. a year. Mm -hmm. um, how many awards did he? He Well, he didn't get them at the time, but he actually was wounded seven times. So he had seven Purple Hearts, three Bronze Star Medals for Sicily, Anzio, Normandy. Normandy was with uh, Valor. Uh, he was awarded, but never received the Distinguished Service Cross, so I'm still trying to get that. Mm -hmm. And um, Arrowhead for First in Battle. Um, but with all those medals, uh, Eddie's, he didn't care about those. He, he said his airborne wings were his favorite wings, mm -hmm. or his favorite medal, because um, he said everything else just came with a job. So he, was, he had to earn those. He had to earn his wings, everything. So there was a lot of humility to Eddie. He didn't really, even though most people look at that seven, more than seven times, that's, that's a lot of battle. That was too much for, for any one person. But uh, yeah, he loved his airborne wings. Loved his airport wing. Yeah. He fought for our country so bravely. Um, he didn't think he'd have to fight when he got back. No. He wasn't in the position. He fight. wasn't in the position. No. So he gets back. Um, tell me about when he gets back. So he, he gets back uh, from being a prisoner of war and all that combat. And he was in such bad shape they couldn't discharge him or even re enlist him. So they furloughed him for 63 days, and then he's in such bad shape that it had another 10 days. So he just went home to his mom and pa, who, like any other family, was not prepared for who came home. They didn't even recognize their son. You know, from starvation, he was like 19, 20 years old by then. You know, his gray hair, you know, skinny, starved, had been starving to death. And so during that time, the, the 73 days, I mean, he heavily drank. Um, he would pass out. He'd think his family were the Germans. They would have to leave the house because he would, you know, just uh, scream and he couldn't stop screaming. They said he would sit in the woods and, and with a shotgun and he wouldn't come out. You know, so this, uh, so that's how he came back. And then when he was in enough shape to, to go back, they, uh, they actually kicked him out unfit for further service. And they gave him 10% uh, for scars. And they said his nervous condition that he had was from a car accident that happened before the war. So all the campaigns he was in, prisoner of war, death camps, Czechoslovakia, coal mines, none of that caused Eddie's nervous condition. That was from, 
from that car accident. And I actually have his VA file. I mean, yeah. it's actually in there. So that's what they did. So they gave him 10% for scars. So he went back in 1948. His mother begged him to go back. He went back and they, they told him to go home and shoot yourself in the head and do yourself and your country a favor because they felt like veterans were just trying to get on the dole. So he said after that he would never go back to VA. And he didn't. Not until uh, he had a heart attack and stroke. Well, and, and he, he fought the VA. I mean, there's a lot of letters in here with him fighting the VA. And he, he wrote congressmen, he wrote uh, governors, he, and he wrote our presidents right. about what was going well, on. Well, he started after he had his heart attack and stroke. I mean, there was, you know, he writes about PTSD not knowing that's what he had. They didn't have yeah. a name for it, so they had a combat fatigue or battle fatigue. Uh, and even a, a original doctor told him, even if you survive, you're going to be an emotional mess, which Eddie was. So he wrote about that in his letters, you know, not knowing that's what he had. So it's pretty raw information just from the heart. So when he had a heart attack and stroke, he just felt like there was nothing else he could do. He couldn't live on $11 a month. And he talked about it. I couldn't hold down a job. I couldn't concentrate, you know, all signs of PTSD. And so he started, you know, after the heart attack and stroke, he, the VA would not give him more than 10%. So he... He started writing the VA. He wrote to President Kennedy. I have that letter because he made copies of everything he wrote because what he found out when he was trying to get help is they were taking vital portions of his file out so it wasn't available. So like all those, when they were wounded in action, they would send home a Western Union telegram. And I actually have one of them, but the rest he would, they were giving him the VA to show that you know he had been wounded. So all that stuff disappeared. So when his file went to Washington, D.C., a lot of that stuff wasn't there. So President Kennedy got involved and they sent Eddie to Birmingham uh, VA instead of Montgomery who would not give him more than 10% and he got 100% the first time. But that was just part of, you know, compensation is just, that's the financial part so you can at least, you know, try to get yourself together but there's a lot more to it. Than that. Yeah, well you shouldn't have to fight that hard for your benefits. He had to fight very hard. He, he wrote a lot of uh, elected officials and, you know, but he was doing it not for himself but on behalf of other veterans because he wasn't the only one. Well, and I wrote a letter, in, or I wrote a letter, I saw a letter in here that he wrote that said, our prisoners, now this is back in the 1950s, I believe, right? Late 50s, maybe? Late 50s, early 60s. Yeah, yeah. Our, our prisoners have more rights than our veterans. Right, right. And I kind of think that's still kind of true today. Can you elaborate on that, what he meant by that? Well, you know, for veterans, um, you know, I mean, I don't know... You know, prisoners, they kind of know what the routine is going to be during the day and why they're there. But when, you know, when a veteran goes to VA, they don't know what to expect. You know, it, to me, it should be, you know, what can we do to help? But, you know, I've heard story after story because of Eddie's, not just his story, but a lot of stories, and it's, it doesn't work that way. You know, it's like you have to have the right paperwork. You have, back then, you had to prove where you were, you know, and they're not in the emotional uh, position to be able to, to provide all that or make sure their paperwork's there and, you know, dot their I's or cross their T's. And, you know, so he shouldn't have had to have fought that hard, but, you know, he, he kept it up. He, he felt like he should have gotten retroactive pay for all the years he, you know, didn't get anything. And he never got that, but he never gave up writing and, and, and being a, a voice for veterans. And a lot of things that he, he wrote back then still apply today. And that's why I think his story is so um, uh, appropriate for today. And even though he went through all these trials, with different with different uh, obstacles, he still loved this country. Yeah, he, he absolutely. Yeah, he, he loved John F. Kennedy. Um, there, there was actually a letter in here to John F. Kennedy before he was assassinated, uh, a warning letter um, about that, um, which I was amazed to see. Uh, he still loved this country. Um, I want to talk about the civil rights part here in a second. Um, we're going to go ahead and take a break. Uh, we'll be right back after these words. Papa, aren't you supposed to get your taxes done today? Oh, I ain't got time. I want to watch the game. Haven't you heard of the Sanders Income Tax Service mobile app that everybody's been talking about? You can get your taxes done now and finish watching your game later. Oh, that's right. Remember, by filing right, you get more here at Sanders Income Tax. Look forward to seeing you this year. All right, we're back with Pam Baker, author of something from Eddie. He, he was, Eddie was involved in civil rights uh, and he was a big proponent of civil rights even back in the 60s. 
but he was a huge uh, civil rights av- activist. And you know, so his Eddie would actually go to Ku Klux Klan meeting and he was turning into the FBI. So he, I have letters that he wrote to Hoover, President Kennedy. He would name names, addresses. Uh, then that was the uh, Women's Auxiliary. And you know, he felt very strongly about that. And you know, he felt like if us, one of us isn't free, none of us are free. And so in the South, I mean, that was, he really alienated himself as well because people knew that he was doing that because he, he was, his life was threatened. But you don't tell a combat vet, you know, or threaten their life because they're not afraid to die. So he did, he did that quite a bit. Um, letters about George Wallace. Um, it's, there's so much, it's, it's, it's hard to cover in one. Um, well, the, the thing to say is he just, he hated hate. Right. Itself, he, he just didn't believe in it. Right. Um, it's easy. Well, hey, one of his, one of my favorite quotes from Eddie is, "It's easy to hate the things we fear, and hate and fear go hand in hand." You know, and so that's how he felt about it. And I think that's in a nutshell. You know, it, it seems like a small saying, but it's, it's actually huge. It's easy to hate the things we fear, and hate and fear go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. I love that. So he, so he wrote. Uh, with, with three years of education, he wrote quite often. He had a typewriter, and he wrote, he preferred to type, correct? Right. Well, he was bayoneted, so his hand was hurt. Yeah. And also, with his education, though, he, he learned to write through a mail correspondence. So they would send him lessons, and he would send it back. So that's where he learned to write. And then after that, it was just, you know, he just went. I mean, everything that Eddie wrote was, uh, I mean, you could read in his letters. He didn't swear or anything like that. He just, it was raw from his heart, how he felt. And he told the truth, and you know, there's something to be said for that. So as he as he was active in civil rights, he he wrote. I'm going to read a passage out of one of the letters he wrote. If the Berlin Wall is a model of shame, what are these legal walls that white Southern legislators legislators have erected to perpetrate a closed white society and keep Southern Negroes down in their place? Let us not confuse our prejudices. For our rights, I mean that's pretty powerful even today. Right. For people, right. you know, especially what's going on with right. today, um, and he—that's from his heart. Yes. It, and he just—he fought for this country. He loved for the, he loved this country, and he just wanted to see the things change. He didn't—he didn't hate this country at all. He, he but he, he held it to a higher re- regard because he fought for it. Well, he what he told me is he loved his country, but he didn't like his government because he felt like his government turned its back on him. And betrayed him. So that's how he felt about his treatment with the VA and after serving his country. But as far as like the country itself, he loved his country absolutely. So I'm I'm gonna kind of back up a little bit. But when he came back to home in the '40s, so the the way it is today, we we honor our veterans. You know, we we thank people for our service now because. They're a big part of our lives. We, we we understand how they fight for our freedoms quite a bit now, um, but that wasn't that was it wasn't like that back in the forties, and especially for Vietnam veterans too. People they 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 weren't they weren't respected at all. Well, they weren't welcome home. Well, actually, what I found out also when Eddie was living with me is that neither were prisoners of war in World War Two. He was not welcome home because they were considered traitors for getting caught. So there was no. People think of World War II and they think of ticker tape parades and, and and all that kind of stuff and welcome home. Well, Eddie was not welcome home. He was considered a traitor. So he had that part of, uh, you know, trying to fit back into home and and, and knowing that, that he, they felt like he was a traitor. Well, and, and it's sad because people don't realize what he gave up to for this country. Well, for, you know, not just Eddie, but for a lot of veterans, I think... From what I hear, things have gotten better, but I still think there's a lot that have been left behind that have not been heard. They're still fighting for their benefits, and you know that shouldn't be a part of our conversation. You know, Eddie, no, he should not have had to fight as hard as he did for his benefits. But you know, that's still the case. You know, yes, some get their benefits, but they still you have Vietnam vets without benefits, you got Korean vets without benefits. You know, things that they earn. And in Eddie's letters, he even said that he goes, "I only ask." For what I earned, you know, I believe he earned a hundred percent, but that's all he says. All I need better to ask for. I just want what I earned. Well, and then he also got a check from John F. Kennedy. He he, he did. Well, 
uh, part of it is POW money, which that's how he referred it, was $800 missing. So during correspondence, President Kennedy sent him a check for $800, and the letter that I have, Eddie was sending it back saying, you know, that he was glad that somebody in government actually cared, but that wasn't the point. So Eddie was always about right and wrong. Mm -hmm. So he appreciated the gesture, but he wanted VA to do the right thing. He, they wanted, he wanted them to give it back. So they, they did have a, a correspondence back and forth. Uh, he also corresponded with um, President Johnson as well. Actually longer than he did with President Kennedy. Well, and with President Johnson, he must have had a part of his heart because didn't he invite him to a wedding? Well, he was invited to Johnson's inaugural, inaugural. and his daughter's wedding. Daughter's so wedding. the funny thing about this, they never <laughs> met, they never knew how he lived in the woods. You know, there was a little yeah. guy typing on his typewriter and sending stuff out. And uh, so, you know, that's kind of a funny part of it. But they, but he would tell President Johnson what's what, too, about how to do his job. and. And, um, you know, you accepted the responsibility and here's what you need to do. And, and at one point he wrote him that he wanted to go to school. He says, when I was in combat, in prisoner of war, I should have been in high school. You know, now yeah. I want to go to college. You know, I want to go here. I want, I want you to make that happen. Yeah. You know, it was pretty, pretty direct. It's in the book. <laughs> uh, pretty direct. And, uh, you know, but he was, you know, he was telling the truth. He yeah. wanted to be educated. So why don't we go ahead and take a break and we'll be right back from work for our sponsors. At this moment, in Stockton, Sacramento, and San Francisco, a University of the Pacific student has made a decision. A decision to learn, live, and lead with purpose in mind. Here, it's all about moments. Moments that change lives, families, communities, economies, the world. At University of the Pacific, these moments give life purpose. They give us purpose, too. After all, we share one future. Join us. University of the Pacific. All right, we're back with Ann Baker, author, something from Eddie. Uh, there's so much information in this book. It's, it's, it's a short book, but yeah, so much information. And I wanted to read, I talked, I covered earlier about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And this, this letter was dated uh, September 23rd, 1963. Dear President Kennedy, Vice President Johnson has my VA difficulties in hand. I am sure he will see them through. Sir, you must stop riding in open cars through the streets. Florida sounds fine, but Alabama or Texas, no. Not in the, not in the near future. I think you should use a decoy dum dummy to, for exposed appearances. I am sure every precaution is taken, but there are certain elements of danger that simply cannot be accounted for. Now that's powerful. That, that was um, two months before he was assassinated. A lot of people have asked, and they wonder if, uh, if actually President Kennedy or somebody actually got that letter, because that's kind of chilling. I mean, he's predicting he's going to be killed in an open car. Because so, he, President Kennedy was for civil rights. He was for everybody. Right, right. And Yeah, he loved President Kennedy. Yeah, it, it, President Kennedy and President Lincoln are my, two of my favorite presidents because they're for civil rights, they're for equal rights, and I just, they're, Two of my favorites. Right. I, I respect them. Rights. Yeah, human, human rights. rights. Yeah. Human rights, but. Yeah, and then uh, Eddie also talked about. He, he wrote a letter to Mrs. Rose. Now, I don't know who Mrs. Rose is. There's a lot of letters that I don't know who they are either, but he wrote to everybody, so there's there's a lot of people on the list. I don't know who they are. Some of them are well known names, but I don't know who Mrs. Rose is. Okay. Um, so, Mrs. Rose, this, this letter goes to Mrs. Rose. And I'm going to kind of jump around here a little bit. Um, but this is page 71, go, going through 72. Um, but the one thing that stood out was Hitler's German, Germany burned books. Wallace is out Alabama burned schools. We have homes and churches bombed. We have people beaten and shot. In fact, Nazi Germany and Wallace, Alabama are identical in many ways. Too many, way, too many ways to sue people. Do not take my word for this. Take a look at this record. It has all been reported in all media. And he was really big on civil rights because he, he goes on to say, an Alabama Negro saved my life in Anzio. He lost his arm doing it. He was fighting for you too, Mrs. Rose. He shed his blood to save my, my life and your freedom. Let us tear down those white only signs and laws. And there shouldn't be laws to do that. That's just a common sense thing people should be doing. Well, he felt like, why don't we, you know, and it's not in that letter, but he said, why can't we take those white-only signs 
down out of decency? Why do we have to be forced? Why do we have to have laws? You know, he was right about that. It would have been so much easier um, to take those down and do things out of decency. So such an attitude devotes evil sicknesses, um, sickness. Central government is a Hitler phrase, and unbecoming any American. As a combat disabled veteran and an ex-POW of Hitler, I resent any American calling our federal government the central government in sorrow. And then he he, he signed it, M.J. Marsh, which I learned that was him, because <laughs> it threw me off. I'm thinking, who's M.J. Marsh? Well, he used it too. So to make his point, so he was Eddie Livingston, but he was Minton G. Marsh. So he started a Wiregrass Writers Club, and he was the president and vice president. Of course, nobody would know that, but he had letterhead yeah. made, and so he would send, <laughs> he would send letters uh, from either one, where if they weren't listening to Eddie, they were going to listen to Minton G. Marsh. So you say Eddie is actually not the hero in this book. You say it's his wife. And his wife is, I lost her name, but... Helen. Helen uh, Waters. Helen Waters. Think, okay. Um, how did they meet? So they met through a mail correspondence. And I actually found some stuff in the house when I was down there that uh, they would have ads. So women would say, I'm a good housekeeper, or whatever, I can cook, or whatever. So they had a little ad, so that's how they met. So they met, she was in Florida, he was in Alabama, so they corresponded. Mm -hmm. And so that's how they met. And, um, you know, just to, you know, to finish that story, how that all happened. So in the letters, Helen didn't think anybody would marry her because she was told she was ugly. And Eddie didn't think anybody would marry him because of his uh, combat, you know, his whole military history. Mm -hmm. So neither one of them thought that anybody would want them. So that's how they, they, they got together. Uh, he would reassure her, you know, that he wasn't good looking and it didn't matter. And, and he actually wrote, and I read this, you know, practically by my heart, but one of the letters he wrote to her in 1966 before they got married, he said, I, I know you're a good and decent person. I think I'll be the problem. And he said, I have good days and I have those other days. He said, it's like a daytime nightmare. I'm frightened and suspicious of almost everyone. So he was already telling her that he had problems, you know, not knowing. And that's the raw part of PTSD. It's not a clinical definition. And he's just telling you from his heart how he felt. Mm -hmm. and, and so they did get married. And, and um, you know, she, they stayed married until they, she passed away first. But um, the, the reason that I believe Helen's the hero in the story, and I know people think that because of Eddie's military service and all his medals, you know, that he's a hero, and I'm not saying that he's not, but, you know, Helen stood by him during the worst of times. Mm -hmm. She stuck with him, and I don't know if you want to get into how they were found, but, you know, she stayed with him no matter what. And she loved him no matter what. And, you know, so there was no books to read about how to love, or, you know, she knew Eddie had problems, she just maybe felt like she could just love him through it. But, you know, Helen you know, made a, a great personal sacrifice, you know, and, and she didn't see it that way. And They loved each other. They loved each other. They got married in 1966? Yes. Um, they stayed married. They loved each other. Um, there's pictures in here of the house they were in. Right. And they lived in a squalor. And right. No were, lights or water for over 30 years. No lights only. And you can tell, but it, we'll show these pictures later, but just the pictures alone are just so, like, wow. You know, how could people, like, how could a veteran you know, right. live like this. Well, actually, it's any human being. Actually, I used to yeah. clean houses, so I've seen different levels of disarray or whatever. But this is, uh, when I my brother found them living in that condition, I was thinking I could go down there and clean their house. You know, I've done construction cleanup. I think, oh, it'll take me probably a week. But it was way beyond that. And Helen's part of that is, I don't want to say people's sacrifices make you a hero, but she endured... Three years, she had a broken hip, so my brother found them, mm -hmm. uh, went out there on just on a hunch or whatever, and went back there and lo uh, looked them up. Uh, she was in a room uh, in the back, in her room, and the, and the bed and the floor was so rotted, it had actually fallen through the floor. And she had a broken hip, and so she couldn't get up. And the paperwork that I saw, they said it was eight months. I was hoping it was only eight months, of not even that, but. The paperwork that I saw, the way her hip was, uh, was three years. So uh, Eddie was paranoid and didn't trust people, and so they, he would, you know, he took care of her like a comrade on a battlefield. Mm -hmm. You know, he felt he was taking care of her. You know, the rest of us look like, you know, how could that happen? But, you know, we don't, 
none of us know how we would react. So yeah. Helen, you know, even after she was found and they got her out of the house, you know, the paramed even the paramedics were crying. You know, she was worried about Eddie because they knew they would put him on a mental ward, mm -hmm. and he was always afraid of that and afraid of VA. So even in her own condition, with her clothes, you know, stuck to her, and they had to get a sheet and lift her up out of the floor. And uh, my brother was there. He said the paramedics were crying, and and even at the hospital, you know, one of the emergency room nurses went home and, and got clothes for her. So there was a, a lot around Helen and a lot of misunderstanding about that. But you know, through it all, I mean, when I went down there and met her, you know, she loved Eddie. You know, that that's all that was. And so, uh, you know, she gets lost in the story, and a lot of families do because we. You know, we, we understand the better to sacrifice or we don't, not to the level that they know. And, you know, she still loved him no matter what. And that's why I feel like she's in the, you know, like the hero in the story. Because her voice wasn't heard and she made a lot of sacrifices and loved him no matter what. Yeah, you told me about how uh, Eddie fell asleep in the recliner and she just... Had yeah, she would, he would fall asleep and you know, she just motioned for me to look over at him. She had this yeah. big smile on her face and here's a person who, I mean, her glasses were so old, they were yellow and she was missing teeth and you know, there was comments about when they got married that she was ugly and, and you know, nobody would want her and it's like, well, that's not what I saw and I just saw a beautiful human being with, you know, enormous heart and he didn't. He never felt like he deserved it. You know. Even he told me, "I wish I had never met her. You know, she could have done so much more." You know. I told him, "You can't tell people who to love. You know. She loved you no matter what." So tell me about how he moved in with you. There's a story behind that because he he was in fear because of the uh, the PS PTSD. Thank you. P yeah, PTSD. He hopped on a bus to go to you, and and that's a whole story in itself because you started yeah. writing letters to him when you were in the third grade. Right. right. Um, but tell me about that. So when I flew down there uh, after my brother called me, that's the first time I'd ever met Eddie. So I used to write to him when I was a kid, uh, like third, fourth grade, just you know innocent letters, and uh, so I had never met him. So when I went down there, there was no expression in Eddie's eyes. You know, he didn't want to hug. And I just let him be, you know. And so I got to know him that week, but that was it. And, and so I, uh, I have a toll-free number for my business, so I gave it to him. I said, you can call me anytime you want. Just pick up a phone call if you need to. So I thought that was going to be the last time I saw him. And so they were threatening Eddie in court, saying he had to take colon cancer tests. And then if you don't take him, we're going to put you on the mental ward of the VA hospital. So my brother called me and told me that. And I'm calling Alabama and asking them not to threaten him like that. You're scaring him. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe that he was always a prisoner of war, but it really kicked in then because he felt like they were trying to kill him. And, and so to him, that was real. To everybody else, they thought he was crazy, but not to Eddie. Mm -hmm. So uh, to put distance between him and, and Houston County and Alabama, Eddie caught the Greyhound bus and came to California. So he called me from Los Angeles and I said, Eddie, where are you? And, he said, I'm in L.A., in Los Angeles. I'm like, oh my God, I live in the Bay Area. So I'm thinking here, here's somebody 80 years old, you know, uh, in California, has never been here, you know, trying to get to me. So I said, well, get a bus ticket to Stockton and call me back. And uh, so he called me back and, you know, I picked him up the next morning in Stockton, California. So he lived with me uh, until he passed away. Because his wife died three weeks after he got here. You know, she took the news hard. And uh, they said they said she died of a broken heart. So I told Eddie, he's, you can live with me for as long as you want. So that's yeah. that's how we met. And he was devastated to hear about that. He, you know, he was devastated. And, and I tried to get him to go back when she was sick. But he said that after Normandy, he never flew. You know, I said, well, we can take the train. I'll go with you. And, mm -hmm. you know, he was just, he had so much. The prisoner of war had really kicked in, you know, that they were trying to kill him. So there was no reasoning. With Eddie, and it wasn't because he didn't care. He was, we were sending her flowers and, you know, trying to keep the communication open. And he felt like he was going to go back. He just thought things would die down and they would stop threatening him in court. Mm -hmm. um, but you know that obviously didn't happen. So that's yeah. So he stayed with me until he passed away. Well, and the the unfortunate thing about all this too, um, there was money stolen from him over the years, also. Well, the well actually. Um, that part of it, so in 
every, every state has different laws. So they had gone to his post office box, the sheriff, and took his VA pension check. And they created an account, and then they would call Eddie and you know ask him, or send a letter, tell us what you need and we'll send you some money. Mm -hmm. And well, that was his VA pension. That's actually a federal offense to do that. There was no court order to do that. They just went and did it. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so he, he eventually got the money back, but initially they were taking his check, so I went to the VA in Oakland and got his address changed so the check would come here. But they just, they didn't let up, and they were still, he still had to prove that he could handle his own financial affairs. And uh, so I had to go to take him to a psychiatrist to see if he could take a competency test. Which he passed, you know. I'm not sure I could have, but yeah. he passed, and so he was. So his checks, you know, came to him, but it was still a process. Even then, even seeing how he lived and what happened, like nobody stopped and said, "How did this happen?" You know, they knew he was a veteran. I said, "You know, people just wake up and live like that for nothing." So I said, "Something happened," and you know, I was trying to get people off the judgment part and how it looked and understand that was a there was a reason this happened. You know, he, he didn't get the help. Compensation is one thing, but he didn't get the help that he really needed. You know, he needed mental help. He needed to be able to talk about it, but he didn't trust VA. So eventually he got some of the money back that they had taken in Alabama. Okay. You went through a lot. You, you went through a lot with him through, through getting that back for him. Um, and that's kind of what your purpose is today. You know, right. you feel... You, you, you went through that stuff with Eddie, and maybe 10% of that stuff, but that was enough. Right, right. And you feel there's other veterans out there in need. Well, I feel like there's a lot of veterans. Um, you know, we hear, you know, whatever we hear in the news, that it's gotten better. Sometimes I'll hear a veteran say it's gotten better. You know, better than what? You know, better than was when Eddie was a veteran? Or, you know, what does that mean? Because I'm, I'm not getting that we spend billions and put, you know, poor billions into the VA and, and we still have this kind of stuff. This is not an isolated case. There's, I, I've had, you know, through Eddie's story, you know, what happens when you tell veterans Eddie's story, you speak about it, not even just veterans, but families will say, well, this happened to my dad or my grandpa. There's always a relatable story of how they came back and drank or, you know, that they, they, things work good for them. And, and so it brings up a lot of things that opens up a conversation that, you know, that we're, we're missing something here. And just, just the human part of it. Well, I want to, I want to leave with a funny story before we take a break. Um, now you told me, you don't have to go into the details, but he had a motto, a man needs two pair of pants, one to wear and one to wash. Yes. Um, can you tell me that story and not go into too much detail, but there's a funny part how he said he doesn't have a dime to his name. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now that is a, so as grim as the story looks, that, you know, Eddie had some funny things. So when it came out, uh, the sheriff's department called and they said, uh, we heard Eddie had a lot of money. Brock came out with a lot of money and I said, well, that's none of my business. It's none of your business either. So then, you know, they wanted to talk to him. I'd give him the phone. You know, that's fine. We have nothing to hide. And so I'd hear him in there. I got a dime in my name. And uh, so one day I had to wash his clothes. There's a, there a whole lot before that and I spoke to you about yeah. that, but we don't need to get into that. Yeah. But anyway, I said, hey, Eddie, I'm going to wash your clothes today. And I asked if I can go in his room because combat vets and prisoners of war have trust issues. So I always wanted to keep building trust. So I went in there and I opened the door. I was like, I realized I needed to wash his clothes, plus soak them maybe. And uh, so I put him on the washing machine and I uh, I just have a washing machine with one dial, no, nothing fancy. And so I turned it off so they could soak. And then when I opened the lid, it was like $100 bills floating on top. And I go, Eddie, you had money in your pocket. And so I fished it out, like one by one, like $1,200. You know, and we never spoke of it again. It was like, just hung it up on his futon. He wanted a futon to sleep. I just hung it up on his bed. and. Let it dry out, and that's the last we ever spoke of it. And I hear him on the phone, I got a dime in my name. So, yeah, he was, but he had, well, that's all part of the prisoner of war combat vet thing, you know, that they, they don't tell you everything, and they feel like they have to uh, protect themselves. And so I just let him be. It was, yeah. it was fine. Well, and he was such a caring guy. He fed all the animals. Um, you told me stories about how he fed both your dogs. Well, yeah, I had a yellow lab and a, another, it was a soft coat of wheat and terrier, she was a rescue. And so I'd say, Eddie, breakfast is ready. And so my yellow lab would get his bowl 
all three of them were going to the kitchen at the same time. So it was Goldie, Eddie, Buddy. You know, Buddy had his bowl and put it next to his um, chair. But yeah, even in Alabama, he was feeding the cat, all the feral cats. He fed the crows. You know, he said he trusted animals, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, he, you know, with his dog story, that always was part of him. He loved yeah. animals. So, yeah, he was that way. Yeah, what an amazing guy. Yeah, he was. Good human being. All right, we're going to finish up. We're going to take this break. And we'll we're going to learn more about Pam and her book on how you can get this book. And it's just an amazing book. It, it, makes, it makes me speechless like usual, but it's just an amazing book. We'll be right back right after these words. At Tiny Tanks Jumpers, we strive to provide you with quality customer service. Serving Modesto, Ripon, Ceres, Turlock, Manteca, Lathrop, Weston Ranch, Stockton, Lodi, and Tracy. For more information, please call Nicole at 209-858-8866 or look us up on Yelp. We're back with Pam Baker, author of Something from Eddie. You have an objective here today. You want people to write to Eddie and just talk as people can really write their heart on paper, right? Right. Well, one of the things about Eddie's story, and I know this from revealing his letters and, and speaking, that they'll tell me their story. And I, I believe that there's a lot of opportunity here. There's a lot of people that can't be heard. You know, there's no venue for them. You know, and through letter writing, which I believe is from your heart, you know, if there's a letter in here or uh, on Facebook that I share, you know, write a letter to Eddie. And, I, you know, I have a post office box. I mean, I really just encourage you to sit down and write to Eddie, you know, because a lot of things he writes about veterans they're going to relate to. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a way to get it out, your story out, um, to be heard. Even if it was just me, but I think it's, it's more than that. I think it's pretty powerful to sit down and write a letter. And how do people do that? So I do have a post office box, so you can uh, send it to me, Pam Baker, um, P.O. Box 543, Elk Grove, California 95624. Or uh, something from Eddie at gmail.com. So either way, whether it's an, um, I really encourage you to sit down and write a letter by hand because a lot will come out. And also families, not just veterans. You know, there's a lot in here that will touch you. And, and I've heard many, many stories uh, from families. His story will invoke uh, my grandfather or my dad or my parents. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty powerful to sit down and write a letter. So write, write to Eddie. So... How do people get this beautiful book right here? It is on Amazon.com, or if you use the email something from Eddie at gmail.com, I can also uh, send the copy. Okay. So we can use PayPal and, and do it like that. Yeah, and I like the way, um, I'd rather do the latter, because I know Amazon has rules for authors, and which I don't agree with, but... So they um, can write to me, and, and, uh, and uh, we can do it through PayPal, it'll be less expensive than... Um, doing it online. Okay. So I'd be more than happy to do that. All right. Well, Pam, thank you for coming on today. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story mm -hmm. and sharing the book with people. And I'm looking forward to the next one. Gonna more. Come. Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Our who came to town. No, yeah. That's the whole story. But, you know, thank you so much for having me on. I think it's a compelling story, and, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. You're welcome. Now, if you're a small business owner or an author that would like to have their voice heard, please contact me at newsmallbusinessvoice at gmail.com or you can call the office 319-535-5928 and inquire about the show. Again, Pam, thank you for coming on. You're welcome. Thank you. And we're just all about local here, so join the crusade and buy local. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.